Yeah. Well, that's some awesome singing right there. Uh, let's give it up for uh, White Chocolate right there, Jacob Beebe, amen. Man, we're fired up. Well, let's turn our Bibles over to Malachi chapter 1. Let's just get right into it. I hope you're excited again to the Word of God this morning. Malachi chapter 1. The last book of the Old Testament. And give me an amen once you're there. Amen. All right, nice. You guys are quick with it today. That's awesome. Malachi 1. Verse 11, we understand the scene here is 430 B.C. And God's people have returned to Jerusalem. The temple has been rebuilt, and yet things are still not good. People were not doing things with the right heart. And the people, the leaders stopped calling the people to the standard of God. And yet, through the prophet Malachi, God still has some great news for them. Yeah. In verse 11, the Bible says, My name will be great among the nations. For where the sun rises to where it sets, in every place, incense and pure offerings we brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. What an amazing passage we see over here. That we know that God, despite the darkness, despite what was going on even with his own people, he says, my name will still be great among the nations. He says from where the sun sets to where the sun rises, everyone will know who Jehovah God is. And we know in the same book of Malachi in chapter 3, the Bible says, the Lord our God does not change. You see, he wanted his name to be great amongst the nations in 430 B.C. But we know that God in the 21st century, in 2023, he wants his name to be great among the nations. From Los Angeles to China, from China to Ghana, from Ghana to Hawaii, all around the world, God wants his name to be great among the nations. And that's the title of our lesson here this morning. Great among the nations. What an amazing service we had so far, have we not? Uh, Caleb and Brianna, what an amazing welcome they did for us. Again, up for them. Uh, what a heart-moving communion by the Mahangos. Let's get up for the Mahangos one more time. And a nice stirring contribution from Paco and Haley right there. I hope we gave our contro and our special missions. Amen. So we understand that we have this famous kingdom song. Great among the nations. And I'm a preacher, not a singer. I mean, Brianna admonished us uh, or encouraged us <laughs> that uh, those who could sing, you guys sing like angels. I'm not one of those guys, so I'm not going to sing for you. I'm going to preach for you this morning. But we are going to take our points from the lyrics from that great kingdom song. Great among the nations. It begins and says... Isaiah saw that it will come, beginning from Jerusalem. In the last days to every tongue, to every nation. And Daniel saw through prophet's eyes a kingdom that will never die. A mountain that would fill the earth. A rock that would endure. That would be great among the nations. Our first point, a mountain that will fill the earth the earth. We got to go to, it has to be one of my favorite passages, Daniel chapter 2. Let's turn over there. Daniel 2, we're going to begin our reading in verse 31. Before we read though, I think we have to have a deep conviction on what's going on before we read the passage we're going to read over here in Daniel 2. The year is 550 B.C. We know that in 606 B.C. was the first slavery deportation of the people of Judah to Babylon. And now by this time, all of God's people are under the yoke of slavery of the Babylonian Empire and their king, Nebuchadnezzar. And then one night, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that freaks him 
out. And he tells the, his advisors that, tell me this dream without me telling you, and then interpret it for me. If you don't, I'm going to kill all of you guys. And if someone does interpret but gets it wrong, I'm not only going to kill that guy, I'm going to kill everybody. So this guy was tripping. <laughs> so people are freaking out, but then luckily for them, amongst the advisors was Daniel. And he goes and prays to God, and we know what is impossible with man can become possible with God. And we pick up the dialogue between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar in verse 31. Your majesty, this is Daniel speaking. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of bay clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock, the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Wow. Let's stop right there. What's amazing here, the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar sees this awesome, enormous, dazzling statue. And it looked unstoppable. And the difference, and the statue was broken down by different compartments of metal. Head of gold, breastplate of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, and legs and feet iron mixed with clay. Then all of a sudden, you guys, just put yourself in Nebuchadnezzar's shoes. All of a sudden, in this dream, he sees a hand. And it says it's not a human hand. So whose hand is it? The hand of God. The hand of God goes to a mountain. We know from the Old Testament, it's not some arbitrary mountain. Mountain in the Old Testament is synonymous with kingdom. He goes to the kingdom, doesn't get the whole mountain, but gets a little rock. And then from that mountain, he throws it like a baseball player with 90 miles per hour. Not the head, not the breastplate, not the belly, but at the foot. And what looked awesome, what looked so dazzling, what looks unstoppable, becomes dust. Wow. Wow. And that little rock becomes a huge mountain that fills the whole earth. Pretty awesome dream right there. Yeah. Now, we know for the kingdom state, what does this mean? Let's continue reading. Oh, okay. Verse 36. The dialogue continues. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Notice it says we, and that means you are relying on God. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of bay clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay, as the toes were partly iron and partly clay. So this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. Just as you saw the iron mixed with bay clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixed with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. 
This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Wow. It just, it just is always awesome when you read this passage. So the key to understanding this passage is indeed verse 38. Well, in the dialogue between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, he tells Nebuchadnezzar, you are that head of gold. So what we learn from this statue is that the different compartments of metal represent different kings and their kingdoms. And the head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Now all we have to recollect are a historical knowledge of the past to see who comes after these kings. Well, we know that the Persian kingdom comes to power after the kingdom of Babylon. And then the Greek empire, or Alexander the Great, comes to power. And then at the end is indeed the Roman empire, the iron and clay kingdom. Now, why gold? Why silver? Why bronze? Why iron and clay? Well, we know that these were the predominant metals that they used in their kingdom. Babylon is all about gold. Persia is all about silver, and then the Greeks are all about the bronze, and then iron and clay for the Roman Empire, because what led to their demise was civil war, as iron does not mix with clay. And the Bible is amazing, because it's written here in 550 BC, and yet it's prophesying about almost a thousand of years of history to the T. To even go further, the Bible mentions a king of Persia, his name is Cyrus, a couple hundred years before he was born by name. And it says that he will be the king that will free the Jewish people from the slavery yoke of Babylon. To even go further in the book of Daniel, it prophesies also about Alexander the Great, even here. He says that he will rule the whole known world. And we know that is true. Alexander the Great did rule the whole known world, and he got every single person to speak one language, which was Greek. It's just fascinating. If you came here doubting whether or not the Bible's true, if you came here doubting whether or not this is an historically accurate book, if you came here doubting whether or not this is the very words of God, I hope you're convinced this morning that right here is not the words of man. This is the very words of God right here. And what's so fascinating, though, is that that little rock didn't go to the Babylon Empire, didn't go to the Persians, didn't go to the Greeks. It hit the foot, representing the Roman Empire. Verse 44 of Daniel 2 says, in the time of those kings, God is going to establish his kingdom that will endure forever. What does that mean? that God's kingdom is going to come during the time of the Roman Empire. And we know that's historically accurate. As Jesus came and started his ministry in 26 AD, was crucified in 29 AD, and then after his resurrection, he talks about the kingdom for 40 straight days. And when he ascends up to heaven, that's when the kingdom starts in Acts chapter 2, when 3,000 souls were baptized at the day of Pentecost. Amen. This prophecy is about God's church. It's about the kingdom of God, a mountain that will fill the earth. And the first century church did exactly that. Just for reference, we just mentioned Acts 2. 3,000 souls were baptized. And then in Acts 4, the Bible says 4,000 men were amongst them. Oh, we have to have a conviction, brothers. We have, need to have a fired up men's ministry, man. I love how the brothers bark right there, you know. <laughs> then Acts 17, verse 6, it says that these men, they turned the whole world upside down. So they not just filled Jerusalem with the teaching, they filled the whole earth with the teaching of God. Let's turn over to Colossians 1. Let's see, did the first century fill the whole earth? Colossians 
Colossians 1 and verse 23. The Bible says, if you continue your faith, Colossians 1 verse 23, here's some pages turning. If you continue your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So that prophecy in Daniel 2 said they filled the whole earth. And we know that in Mark 16, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he says, go to all creation and preach the gospel. In Colossians 1, 23, this is around 62 AD, and Paul's preaching says that every creature heard, heard about the gospel. What does that teach us? The same Greek word here for creation or creature is the same Greek word in Mark 16. That all mankind in the first century heard about what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Does it mean that everyone became a disciple? By no means. But for sure you can bet your bottom dollar that the whole earth was filled with the mountain, filled with the kingdom of God, filled with Jesus Christ teaching everyone I heard. And here's the thing. We want to be like this church. That's who we are. We want to be like the church in the first century and fill the whole earth here now in the 21st century. That's what Jesus says. Make disciples of all nations, baptize them, and teach them to obey. But think about it. It only was 120 people that Jesus had at the end. But then they were able to get to the whole world. What can a metro coast of 180 sold out disciples of Jesus? What can we do here in Los Angeles? We can fill the whole city with the teachings of Jesus Christ. It was once said, it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. That explains Jesus and the apostles 120, but I believe that explains you as well. You know, on May 6, 2007, I was 11 years old. And <laughs> didn't really have a care in the world. Elementary school and middle school was pretty odd. Well, middle school was a tough time, but elementary school, you can know, try to figure out yourself in middle school, you know what I'm saying? But unbeknownst to me, I grew up right over there in the north, Canoga Park, Willie Mills. I didn't know what was going on around me. But in May 6, 2007, an irate, tireless minority, minority from Portland, 42 sold out disciples came down to Los Angeles and planted the International Christian Church. And it's awesome to have Kip and Elena with us. Just think about that, 42. Just a little rock, a little rock, came to Los Angeles. Now, in 2023, 42 disciples are now almost 11,000 disciples in 150 churches in 60 nations. You can see it, that the mountain is filling the whole earth again. But I, 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 I want to, I, I hope you have a conviction. We're here to evangelize the world. It's God's special plan to help us stay saved. If we're not going to stay on the offense, we're not going to see God in heaven. We will become lukewarm. And I'd like to stay in that mindset. That keeps me going. And I hope it keeps you going here this morning as well. But I want to convince you that we're just still a spark. The fire hasn't started completely. We have a lot of work to do. At this time, you, you may have a printout on your feet by this point. It was on your seats earlier. It is uh, the list of all the church plantings. Yeah. 
Yeah. We decided to print this out because we want all of us to have a conviction where our money is going to. And I want to encourage us to, to pray for all these church plantings. Just to name a few. We know our very own NIE is going to Maui, Hawaii. That's one of our very own, baptized right here in the Southland. Made a decision to give up everything. And going to a pretty awesome place, but still a lost place that needs to hear the gospel. Our beloved Kwaku and Ashley, those who are from San Francisco. Even those who are not, Kwaku and Ashley have impacted the whole world. They're going to Ghana. Blatty and Cello, from the South, already have been blown to Thailand. Look at these 31 church plantings. There's so much more work to do. I hope you see this. And I just have a couple questions for you guys. Do you want to see these church plantings happen here in 2023? Do you want to pass on a church to our future children that that church will be fired up? Do you want to see the evangelization of the nations in this generation? Yeah. All right, now let's put our money where our mouth is. You said it. We know we are in special mission seasons. And right now it's time for us to rally. I appreciate the good news that Paco shared about the campus. Even in Atlanta, Atlanta, they raised $43,000 in one week. One week. It's because we have a deep conviction that we want to see the mountain fill the whole earth. Yeah. And to think about it, Matt 28, it says, go and make disciples of all nations. Yeah. All nations means all nations. <laughs> Baptize them and teach them to obey. And the Bible says that God will be with us to the very end of the age. But what does that mean then? If we don't make disciples of all nations, if we don't baptize them, and if we don't teach them to obey, then God will no longer be with us. So you choose. Is world evangelism a salvation issue? I'll put it before you, it is, and that's why we're going to do it in this century. The lyrics of great among the nations continue. It says, so great among the nations, bringing sunlight to the dark and offering salvation to the world of broken hearts. Point number two, offering salvation to a world of broken hearts. Let's turn to John chapter three. John three. In verse 1, another passage a lot of us are familiar with, but another great passage. Give me an amen when you're there. John 3, verse 1, the Bible says, Now there is a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asks. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born Again, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. Stop right there. So here we see a dialogue between Jesus and a man who was a part of the, ruling, the Jewish ruling council named Nicodemus. We understand from John 19 that Nicodemus goes from a doubter to a disciple. But over here, he is doubting. He comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, you, you must be from God. But Jesus, he was really in his heart and doesn't even retain what he was saying. He attacks his motives and attacks him to see what does it really mean to be born again.
says, if you want to see the kingdom, you got to be born again. Yeah. What is he talking about? He's talking about repentance, to just see the kingdom. And then Nicodemus is just gets a little, he yells at Jesus. There's an exclamation point. He's like, what do you mean? I, I got to get born again. I can't enter my mother's womb to be born again. You see, Nicodemus was focused on the physical rather than the spiritual. Jesus doesn't even entertain his folly and just tells him, if you want to enter the kingdom, you have to be born of water and spirit. What are you talking about? He's talking about being baptized. So to see the kingdom, you got to repent. To enter it, you got to get baptized. And this is what God is offering the whole world. A message of salvation. But Nicodemus, because of his pride, didn't realize it. It was once said, the eyes are useless when the mind is blind. Wow. Nicodemus saw Jesus, but his mind was blind to the scriptures because of his pride. Wow. Let's see what Jesus says next. In verse 10, it says, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very true, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So Jesus then kind of goes after Nicodemus and says, you're a teacher. You're a preacher. You lead people and you're supposed to lead them to Christ. Do you not understand these things? And sadly, even now, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 4 that there will come a time people want not want to put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. And there be many preachers that come up from a pulpit like this and tell people what they want to hear. Tell them all you got to do is believe. And you have to actually repent or be baptized and you'll be saved. Or all you got to do is baptize your babies and then, com and then confirm them later. But these are, are false teachings that are leading people astray. It's not offering salvation to a world of broken hearts. It's offering what their itching ears want to hear. And Jesus says, you don't understand this. And then, interesting, he talks about this scene during the Exodus movement with Moses, where people had to see a snake to be saved. And right now we live in a time where people say, all you got to do is believe in Jesus. John 3, 16 is the next passage. And we know that's a famous passage. Tim Tebow made it famous. Uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin made it famous. But what does that scripture really mean? It's not teaching that all you got to do is believe intellectually and be saved. It should lead to repentance. Let's see what exactly the scene that Jesus was talking about in Numbers. Let's go to Numbers 21. Numbers 21, in verse 4. Let's talk about this bronze snake. What is it all about? The Bible says, They traveled from Mount Or along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread. There's no water. And we detest this miserable food. And the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then, the, then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. 
So what was going on here? The people got tired of the man in the morning. And they started to grow impatient along the way. And then because of their sin, God sends snakes to them. And the people get bitten and some die. And you can't just help. Like, it's a vivid illustration of how sin is. It's that poison that's killing our families. That's killing us. That's killing our friends. And what do the people ask? They say, say a prayer for us. Even reminiscent of our modern day society where people want to pray Jesus into their hearts as opposed to obeying Jesus. And what does God say? He says, get a bronze snake, put it on a pole, and anyone who then looks to it will be saved. Now you have to understand, there's millions of people there during this time. If they're all just not just crowding around this pole over here. So if someone's far away and they got sentimental, like, man, I, I need some, I, I'm, I'm kind of down right now. I don't know if I can make my way over there. What's going to happen to them? They're going to die. So how they got saved was looking at the snake and making their way over there. In other words, obeying Jehovah God. In the same way, if they just believed that the snake was there and just wow. prayed that, wow, okay, God, please heal me, they would not have been saved. Wow. In the same way, faith alone does not save us. Wow. What saves us is being reborn and then getting water baptized in the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> but those snakes that try to destroy us, that's sin. You know, I remember in 2019, at the winter workshop, uh, I, I get a call from a brother we baptized in the San Jose ministry that fell away. And he told me that his best friend has just died. Just 40 years old. And I knew him pretty well, so he asked me to do the funeral and the eulogy. And I remember coming to that and doing the eulogy, and the most intense moment was they had an open casket, and I stood right next to him. And one by one by one, his friends and family came and said their final goodbyes. And it brought me to tears. Because all I could think about is I shared my faith with this man three times. Three times. Three times. But he didn't, he declined the offer of salvation. Wow. And then to see him there, lifeless, it just broke me. Yeah. But I just thought about all the different people that I shared with. Yeah. On, all the people that need to take this offer. The world is burning. People's hearts are broken. On, they need to hear the message. They need to know that there is sunlight coming to the dark. They need to know that God is offering them salvation. And how amazing is it when we see young men, young women, and older men and older women accept the offer of salvation of Jesus Christ. As today, it's amazing that just as we're being baptized here today, and then Brian Kim, we're being baptized here today as well. I had the pleasure to be in both of their studies, but more in Brian's studies. And it's so awesome to study the Bible with Brian. You would never guess. This guy looks like he's 20, he's 36 years old. He lives some life. I hope you don't mind me saying that. But he lives, he lives some life in, in, over here. But he said he's just done with the snakes. He's done with the poison. He's done with the sin. And he wants to give his life to Jesus Christ. If you are a guest here this morning, I gotta ask you, is your heart broken today? Well, God is offering salvation. Second Corinthians 6, 6 says that the day of salvation is today. Have you been delaying, but God's been offering you? How long? How long will you need to study the Bible? How long we need to come to church, even those that need to be restored in Christ? 
How long are you going to come and hear and see the fellowship until you make a decision on, to accept that offer? Come on, guys. Come on. The Lord is, they said the, the, the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. His arm is still there. You just got to reach and grab it. And for us as disciples, have we forgotten our mission? Our mission to be ministers of reconciliation. To go and be those. Because it says the arm of the Lord is not too short to say, but what's that arm? It is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the one that stretches out their arm. They're the ones that invite those to church. They're the ones that invite them to Bible talk. They're the ones that help people go from the darkness into God's wonderful light. That's who you are. And don't forget it. I, I want to give you a practical here. Next week, Sunday, is our Sweet 16. I want to inspire and encourage all disciples. Bring a friend. Bring a family member. Every Sunday should be a bring your neighbor day. Every Sunday we should think, who can we bring to hear the words of God? Because that's who we are. We are here on this planet to offer salvation to a world of broken hearts. Now, if we have a deep conviction that we will be a mountain, the kingdom, that fills the whole earth. And have a conviction that we're going to offer salvation to a world of broken hearts. We could do our last point and participate in point three. A movement that will change eternity. We have to understand our goal. Our goal is to, yes, evangelize the nations this generation. Matthew 16, though, says whatever be bound on earth, earth we bound in heaven. Our goal is to get to heaven. That's the goal of a disciple. A movement that would change eternity. And the only way we're going to do that is if we all become mature in Christ. We all need to become like Christ so we can survive the gauntlet and go there one day to heaven. Let's go to Daniel 12. I thought this was a Pretty, inter pretty interesting passage here. Right. Talks about the end times. Dan 12, verse 1. The Bible says, At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, that's the archangel, will rise. Daniel 12. I said, here's some pages still turning. I'm going to wait. Amen. I'm going to heed to the encouragement of the woman of wisdom. They said, please wait before you start reading. <laughs> so we're going to make sure we're there. But I hear, I hear pages turning. I'm, I'm going to wait. Amen. Daniel 12, verse 1. The Bible says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protect your people will rise. There will be a time of distress, such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found, in, found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. A movement that would change eternity. Here we see this passage talking about the end times. That some will rise and go to everlasting contempt. That means hell forever. But then those who are wise... It says they all go to everlasting life. Wise, wisdom. That gets me thinking about maturity. I, I think we have a lot of young Christians recently been baptized. And here's the thing about even those who've been here for a while. 
We got to know once mature doesn't mean you'll always be mature. Wow. Hebrews says that by constant use of what's been taught to you, the original convictions, the first principles, that's when you become mature. So if you've been here a while, you feel a little sleepy or a little out of touch, it's time to make a covenant to get back on fire for the Lord. A star is on fire. A star is hot. And it says that those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. Wow. Who else was called a star? Well, we know in Revelation 22, verse 16, you have to turn there. It says, I, Jesus, sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. We want to become like Christ. That is the whole idea of discipling. That's the idea of Luke 6. We want to be, get discipled. Iron sharpens iron. So we become more and more like Christ. That's the only way that we will be a movement that will change eternity. We all need to get mature in Christ. What does it look like? It becomes, you have to become a teacher. Right now we need some more Bible talks. We need some more Bible talk leaders. Some men and women are going to say, I'm going to stand up. I want to be that wise man, that wise woman that wants to go and help others and lead many to righteousness. If we're not thinking like this, we have to change the way we think and make a decision to then go after leading more and more to righteousness. You know, it's been awesome. I just want to lift up the whole Southland campus ministry. Amen. You know, it's amazing. Uh, you know, we have some students who are out of town. Uh, just one, I want to pray for our dear brother, Caden, who was baptized recently. Just a couple of days ago, he did a, the discipleship study with his whole family. And just as the Bible says, two against three, three against two, his mother and brother-in-law want to become disciples. And it's, it's inspiring because Caden had been a Christian for two months, or even that. I don't even know, maybe less than two months. Uh, but it's, it's amazing to see in the, in the campus to see people start to raise up in the Lord and to, to get more sharp and to become mature. And you know when you have, you're making an impact when you get some persecution. Yeah. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says that, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life, if you want to be like Jesus, you will be persecuted. It's a fact. And I, it's first encouraging for myself to see at USC, where we all we planted all the, the, the campus students there and the campus workers, to see the amount of impact they've had because of their maturity. And this past Thursday, Regina and I had an opportunity to get with the dean of religious life over there. Because they had, and they said since January, they couldn't keep up with the amounts of complaints of what they call prostatizing, or what we like to call sharing our faith, on campus. And they said, we have some concerns about you guys. Well, we get an email a week before where they said, you know, we were a club on campus, but then they said, we're now gonna decertify your club. And I was like, well, amen, well, let's, let's talk about it. So we get there and they, they, they're just saying, like, hey, you guys are, are just, you're, you're having, causing a ruckus here. Um, people are, are, they're feeling pressure. And that's all, all we're doing is invite people to, to do a Bible study. Then what we do a Bible study, we say, go back home and check the notes yourself. There's, there's a pressure from Jesus. But let me tell you what, we're not, the Bible says you shake the dust off your feet. Someone says no. I, there's no pressure from, it's from the Lord. But they didn't want to hear that at all. And then they said, well, here's the thing, you guys are, you guys, we're not, we're done with you guys. You're, you're, and it was, it was personally encouraged me because they said, the, 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 head, the head of the, all of them said, you know, we have these conferences every year, and we talk about all the different Christian clubs on campus. And there's only one we have a problem with. And all of them are with Kip's church. And we're like, amen! Because that means we're having an impact all around the world. And, and I, I told them straight up, hey, you could just certify us, but hey, I'm a citizen of the United States of America. I, I, and we're all citizens. So you're going to find me at the village with all of our disciples, and we're still going to be sharing our faith. 
Addis told him and quoted Acts 4, 19. And Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? You be the judges. That's how we're going to be a movement that changes eternity. Bold preaching for the Lord. And, and, and that is what God wants us to do. Because here's the thing. If we're, what we're doing is of God, you're only fighting against God. And we have a deep conviction that we are a part of a movement of God. In closing, I, I listened to Great Among the Nations all week this week. Before I prayed one day, I, I listened to it 10 times. And it brought me to tears. Because I was thinking about just the gauntlet that we're all going to have to go through. Now, Regina and I had a pleasure to do the ICCM class yesterday. And we talked about how Jesus and Paul are the, 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 the true leaders of the women's liberation movement. And at the end, talked about Peter and his wife getting martyred. And I just thought about that. Wow. What would I do if people go after my own wife and want to crucify her or kill her? I thought about the gauntlet we're going to have to go through, but then I also thought about the joy. I know that I don't have to be here 15 or 20 years, but I plan to be. And the joy to see the world won, but more importantly, the joy of being with all of you in heaven. Of seeing our Lord one day there. And we'll, we'll be there. If we have a deep conviction on our three points. A rock or a mountain that will fill the earth. A people offering salvation to a world of broken hearts. And a movement that will change eternity. Yes, indeed, in the 21st century, God's name will be great among the nations, and to God be the glory.